Hey everyone, in this video we have two functions, f and g, and they are continuous, and we have to prove that the composition is continuous. I should mention here that x, y, and z are topological spaces, so we're going to use the topological definition of continuity in this problem. Before we talk about that though, let's make sure that the composition makes sense. I think it's a good idea to always make sure that things make sense before you try to prove them. So f maps x to y, and g maps y to z. So when we're thinking about g o f, we have to think about the domain of the function. So first you apply f. So f domain is x, so it takes x and maps all elements in capital X to elements in capital Y. So the codomain of f is y, and that's what g considers as, it, as its domain, and it maps that to z. So everything makes sense. g o f is taking an element in x, mapping it to an element in y, and then g is taking an element in y and mapping it to an element in z, so the composition does make sense. Now, let me briefly, briefly recall the definition of continuity that we're going to be using in this problem so you see how it works. This is really, really beautiful. So, I'm going to use the same notation here for f, so hopefully it's not too confusing when we do the proof. So we say f from x to y is continuous, if, and first I'll say it in words, then I'll write it down. Whenever you take an open subset of y, the inverse image of that set is open in x. That's what it means to be continuous. So if for every open o, I like to use o, it's fun to use the o, <laughs> uh, in y. So for every open o contained in y, we have the inverse image of O is open in X. Okay, if you're wondering what this is, we're not really going to be using it in this problem, but I'll just tell you anyways. This is the set of all X's in capital X, such that F of X gets mapped to O. We're not going to need it in this proof, I believe, because we're going to use something a little bit more high level, and I think it should work out. I kind of like went through the, I thought about it, but I haven't worked it out fully, so let's work it out. So proof. So to do a formal proof, we'll start by assuming that we have continuous functions. So suppose x, y, and z are topological spaces, so are topological logical spaces. And let's also assume that f and g are continuous, and f from x to y, and g from y to z are continuous. And you know, I wasn't going to write this down, but you're supposed to write it down. If you're, if you're actually doing math, if you're writing out proofs, you're supposed to write this down, right? You're supposed to write down your assumptions. It's really, really important. So those are our assumptions. Now the claim is that this is continuous. So let's Let's write that down. Let's write down claim. So claim, claim here is that GOF from X to Z is continuous. So we're going to apply the topological definition of continuity to the composition. So to do that, uh, if you look at the definition here, we start by taking an open subset of the codomain. So we'll start by taking an open subset of Z. I'm going to use the same letter. I'm going to use the beautiful O because I love the O. So take any open O contained in Z. And this is a one-way proof. What I mean by a one-way proof is all you do is you just write down what everything means and then you just apply your hypothesis, hypothesis in a direct manner. There's no like trickery, there's, it's, not, it's not hard. If you just carefully think about everything, it should work. So we took an open O and Z. We're trying to show that the inverse image of O under GOF is open in X. That's what we're trying to show, right? We're trying to show that GOF of inverse of O is open in X. So if you're thinking about that directly, you might take a different approach in the proof. Let's not, let's just follow everything the way it goes, like just use our hypothesis and it, it should fall into place. So if O is in Z, and if you look that here, this is the codomain of G. So since O 
is open in Z and G from Y to Z is continuous. Let's be really clear here. So because we have both of these conditions to be true by continuity of G, we have G inverse of O is open in Y. Applying the definition of continuity to G. So we have that this is open in Y. Okay, so now we know something. We know that this is open in Y. So that's the codomain of F. So now we're going to use continuity of F. So let me write it out again. So since G inverse of O is open in Y, so is open in Y, and F, just to really add clarity to everything, it's all about clarity, is continuous. So we have that this is an open subset in Y, which is the codomain of F. F is continuous, so using continuity of F, we have that the inverse image of G inverse of O is open in X. Is open in X. It asked, and here's, here's a leap, there's a leap here. This is a big leap. So this, this, okay, is equal to this, G-O-F inverse of O. So this is a leap. Okay, this is this requires proof. It's not a hard proof. I'll, at some point, I'll I'll make a video on this proof if there's not already one up there. It depends when I when I put this on the internet, but this you can prove easily. So this is an equality. If you've taken even like some abstract algebra, it kind of should remind you of uh, the formula for the inverse of two elements. If you have x y inverse in abstract algebra, that's y inverse x inverse. You see, you you can kind of apply it here. You see how you you've basically flipped them and put the inverses. It's the same idea, right here. X and y are elements in say a group. Here we're looking at functions, which can be elements in a group. So it follows from that, and it follows also from from a direct proof that you can prove. So we're saying that this is open in X. So we started with an open subset of Z, which is the codomain of GOF, and we showed that GOF inverse of O is open in X. So this is precisely the assertion that GOF is continuous. So thus, GOF is continuous. And that completes the proof. I like to finish my proofs with a box with an X. So I kind of took a long time on this proof. I, I, I talked a lot, I explained a lot. You could do this in just a couple minutes. I mean, you can blow through it, but I wanted to go through it slowly. Um, you could probably find this proof in a book, maybe somewhere, um, but I wanted to show you some extra steps. So again, this step needs to be justified. So if you really want to do like a thorough proof, you'd go to the side and say, okay, let me just do this. If you're doing this for, like a homework assignment or something, if you can use this, use it. If you can't, if you can't use it, do it as a lemma, right? Like as a preliminary to your problem. That way it doesn't really clutter the proof because this does take a little bit of work, not a lot, but it does require some, some justification. So I hope this video has been helpful or enlightening in some way to someone out there in the world who is studying mathematics. Take care.